Okay, well, thanks, thanks everyone. I still, I see well, there's still people coming in. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, data visualization is interesting to a lot of people. And well, thank you, Sebastian. Welcome. Uh, you're going. You're up for a very interesting talk. I can tell you that there's going to be lots of cool. Uh, things Sebastian is visualizing. I, I have to admit, I, I wasn't very familiar with what they do myself, and I took a deep dive recently, and there's some really, really cool stuff there. So I'll just let him explain for himself. He's Sebastian Miller, the CTO of Whiteworks, one of our sponsors. Many thanks, Sebastian. It's all up to you. Pleasure. Thank you. Hello? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Perfect. So uh, thank you for the introduction, George. Um, as he said, my name is Sebastian and I work for Wireworks. We are the diagramming experts and we're also sponsoring the conference. So be sure to drop by our booth after my talk to learn more about the products and the services that we have to offer. So uh, what, what's in my agenda today? We, we start by looking at what types of options you have once you decide to use visualizations to gain insights into your connected data. And most of you will probably know one, one or another tool or some off-the-shelf visualization solutions uh, which are available. So we'll be looking at how we can do better if we spend just a little more time to come up with solutions that are really meant to work with that specific use case uh, that we are dealing with. So we'll see how sophisticated automatic uh, diagram layout can dramatically <coughs> improve the ability of the user to actually understand the data sets that they are dealing with. And we'll take a closer look at those cases where transforming the graph as it is stored in the data source, specifically for displays, uh, helps in getting much clearer visualizations. And I'll show you a number of examples of tailored diagram visualizations that help quickly in seeing the most important data that your users want to see. Um, then we'll take a look at how we can improve the user experience and working with the connected data in the diagrams through custom uh, interaction customization through custom interactions. And finally, I'll briefly show the advantages of integrating such a visualization with other systems and other data sources. And after that, uh, I'll be happy to hear, hear the questions that you may have. So uh, who is this talk for? Uh, <laughs> if you're working with connected data, graphs, diagrams, and triple stores, and networks, which you probably are, and then that's a good start. And if you previously tried to visualize your data, or even more so, if maybe if you haven't, um, this talk should be for you. So if you're a, whether you're a data scientist or an engineer and you need to work with data, you should have a good understanding of the options that you have for visualizing this data and maybe also the limitations that there are. And, and as a project manager, if you're already decided to go with visualization or you already have a visualization in your app, I would like to show you some ideas of how you might be able to improve uh, <coughs> what you already have. And if you're a software developer, or at least know a bit of programming, I'll also be showing some tiny source code snippets, but I'll not go into details, so don't be afraid. Just to give you an idea of how much or how little work is needed to actually come up with these solutions. So let's start by looking of at the different types of tools that we have for visualizing connected data. Of course, there's the absolute low-level tools that come uh, as part of the raw, raw data sources that you may have, like um, could be just like text files or an Excel sheet or maybe an interactive database console or textual table browsers, but, th but that's not what most of you would consider visualization, uh, I guess. So, but many of these tools actually come with some rudimentary uh, visualizations built into. And as, a, as an example, you might have seen Neo4j's uh, desktop application where, uh, where you can see those nice little dancing graphs uh, once you manage to, to enter a meaningful cipher query. And uh, the advantages of these, these tools is, is clear that um, you probably have them already because they're part of the data source and um, you get access to all of the data that's in, a, in, a, in the data sources. But that's also dis the disadvantage because it's mostly what maybe developers need to work with. They, they want, if they want to check their data sources and see if, if the data is in the right shape. And they can even be dangerous to use be, but because they might be changing the data once they're browsing it. And they may not be accessible to others, of course. So that's mostly uh, for non-production use, these kind of tools. 
Uh, on the other hand, there's those generic visualization applications, uh, which, which you can just click and run to connect to your data sources. And, and the, these, these uh, make it easy to get at least some kind of visualization of your data onto the screen. Um, they, you, there's only very little uh, low-level knowledge you require to actually get the data onto the screen. Uh, the disadvantage is that this only works when the data comes in the, in the schema that the application understands. So uh, if, your, if your data is structured slightly differently, it can be that these applications uh, fail quickly. Uh, on the positive side of things, they also include slightly advanced uh, visualization and analytics. And one more negative thing, it might be that if you want to deploy that application or that visualization to many users in the end, it might become costly, but that depends on the product, of course. Um, another option is uh, scientific tools that uh, are somewhere in between those first two options. They mostly offer good flexibility and you can rather easily connect to data sources and they, they come with advanced analytics and also visualizations. Uh, often though they focus more on the scalar rather than the connected data side of things. And they are still pretty hard to use for end users. And again there's the, the problem of, um, of possibly deploying these as a solution to end users. Instead today I would like to talk about uh, this option, the option of using visualization software libraries. Um, uh, so these aren't tools that you can simply click and run to start and look at your data, but instead you need to be a software developer or need to have someone uh, who does some uh, set up some software development for you uh, initially to set up the application or create a new application for you that perfectly fits the use case that you have and perfectly helps you with uh, creating an application anew from, or from scratch um, or integrate that in integration, uh, that application uh, into an existing application uh, that you can give away to others or use yourself to inspect uh, the data uh, or your user's data um, with, a, with a use case specific application, sorry. <laughs> um, the cool thing is that uh, you can integrate these components into desktop applications but also into mobile applications and on the web. And most of the time these will be white label integ integrations and solutions, so they won't have, for example, our name on top of it, but they can perfectly fit your corporate design or uh, application look and feel. And as the creator of the app or widget, you can decide where and how the data is sourced, how it will be transformed, and you can determine its precise visualization um, and what interactions there are, whether a user can modify or maybe even edit the data, and how all of this can be integrated possibly into a larger IT infrastructure and with third-party services. In the next slides, I'll show you how this extra effort of uh, setting up the application and, and requiring a, a software developer work with, with the data initially um, can pay off quickly and what use, in what use cases, uh, what advantages uh, this gives you. So, um, Yfiles is our commercial software library for uh, the visualization of diagrams, uh, networks, graphs, and connected data. And I'll be using it for the examples in the following slides. And more specifically, I'll be using Yfiles for HTML, which is just one of the members of a whole family of graph visualization software libraries that we produce. It's specifically built for web technology-based applications and works well on desktops, tablets, mobile devices, and so on. We, we also offer equivalent software for other uh, pro programming languages and platforms. And the unique selling points of, of this, this uh, suite of libraries uh, include that we have a complete set of, the, in fact, it's the, as far as I know, the most complete set of automatic layout algorithms and uh, graph analysis algorithms available and combined with a powerful and flexible viewer engine and most of all really unmatched customizability and extensibility options. Um, so let's take a specific, take a look at a specific use case. This is actually a use case that um, from uh, the International Graph Drawing Symposium which was held just two weeks ago in Prague and there was a, a visualization contest and 
uh, we took part in that contest, and the data was given to us, us as a GraphML file in this case, and uh, GraphML is just, just a static file source. And the context of the data was uh, the Marvel uh, uh, hero character universe from the Marvel uh, movie, movie picture series. And it was about the, the actors, about the heroes, and the movies they participate in. So uh, if you're a programmer, there's some source code uh, on, this, on the slide. I won't go into the details. Um, just so that you see how much effort is required to, to, well, to achieve the, the task at hand. So um, if you're a programmer, basically any source of and format of the data is possible uh, that you can use um, for, for, for the visualization. So it doesn't have to be a certain format, but it could be, well, JSON, be it static or dynamically generated on the server or just XML or text files, even custom binary formats. Um, of course, if you have some database connectors to third-party third databases, you can use them just as well to quickly get your data into the in-memory application for display. Um, but once you have uh, the data in the visualization, it mostly looks like this, rather boring, because most data doesn't come with uh, um, coordinates. So you can let the user uh, like manually untangle the graph, or you can run some automatic layout algorithm to get an initial idea of what the structure of the graph looks like. Uh, this may be nice to look, look at, but it doesn't really have a lot of information in it. I could just as well uh, print the number of nodes on the screen and maybe say that it's a connected graph and it would be probably more useful than that. So um, we should improve that. Uh, at first, obviously, we should be able to identify uh, the elements in, in, the, in, the, in the graph. So um, in this case, we were lucky that there is uh, the names of the heroes and, uh, and of the motion pictures was part of the data source. So of course, we could just go and add uh, the text labels to those elements. Uh, we could be adding any number of uh, text labels to, to the visualization. And we can actually uh, tell the layout algorithm to to uh, consider the node labels so that we don't get overlapping node labels. Um, this is still not really interesting, though. Um, but if we take a look at the data, we see that there's only uh, names of heroes and names of movies. And of course, it would help the user a lot if we uh, make it more easily distinguishable uh, to um, the two types of sets of nodes. Um, so of course, we can use very simple techniques like uh, using different shapes, colors, fills, opacities, whatever comes to your mind to get a visualization like this. But still, this is something that uh, every one of these options that I initially talked about should be able to provide. So this is, well, this is the baseline, and this is uh, where we should start to see whether we can improve uh, the situation. So um, I'm now, now going to uh, present different strategies that we could be using and at the end, I'll show you what we, we, what we have done. Um, knowing that um, if we know nothing about the graph, we can try to use graph analysis algorithms right inside the visualization, uh, for example, to, to determine uh, which, which nodes play a central role in, the graph, a role in the graph, and so on. And we can put that into the visualization, for example, by adding a heat map um, so that users can, in this case, just uh, take a look at the um, degree centrality. It's not terribly useful yet, but it's one option, and depending on the, on the graph, it may be very helpful. Um, in fact, since we know that we are dealing with just two types of nodes, we could also uh, use uh, grouping technologies, put, put the, put the uh, nodes into different groups, and rerun the layout algorithm. This will give us uh, still not a very nice picture, but, but, a, but a better idea of how uh, the graph is structured. So we start to see that there's probably um, uh, just two types of, of nodes, and, and the relationships seem to be just going uh, from, from uh, the heroes to the movies. And there's probably no, no connections in between the, the, the movies or in between the heroes, but the visualization doesn't even show that yet. Um, um, also, the two groups aren't really helpful either. Um, we, uh, in this specific example, there, uh, each element only ever belongs to one group, but we, 
But if we, for example, had uh, multiple group relationships, so, so that uh, a specific item would belong to multiple groups at the same time, we could be using alternative uh, visualiza visualizations like this, and uh, which allow um, uh, overlapping uh, group relationships, for example. But um, even better, we can tell the layout algorithm to take these grouping into account. For example, uh, to uh, divide the visualization space into multiple cells, in this case two rows, and, where, and we just tell it to place uh, the hero nodes in the top row and the movie nodes in the bottom row. And then we can get rid of uh, the coloring because it's still not quite useful. Um, but we, we're still not sure about whether there are connections in between uh, the, the, the movies or the heroes. For this, we can use yet another layout algorithm and where we explicitly tell it to put, put the nodes onto the same horizontal line. Uh, in this case, it's because it seems to be a bipartite layout, meaning that there's uh, um, just relationships in between the two uh, partitions. We are using the hierarchic layout algorithm and telling it to place uh, uh, nodes of the same type into the same layer. And this yields a layout like this. It's very wide, but we can immediately see um, that edges only ever go from the top row to the bottom row, and there's no connections in between uh, the heroes or movies likewise. Um, um, now, how can we improve this further? We, we see that there's, there's an ordering uh, of the nodes as Galaxy, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, and then Volume 1, then Volume 3. Um, there's obviously some ordering involved. Right now, the visualization just used tried to minimize the number of crossings and came up with this ordering. But uh, it would be helpful to actually put these, the movies in, in, an, in an order that is helpful uh, um, for the user to understand the structure rather than trying to minimize the almost endless number of crossings uh, at the top. So we can fetch that data from, a, from another data source and annotate this, uh, this information into, uh, in this case, the movie nodes. So, so uh, um, in the Marvel Universe, uh, all those movies play at a certain time and at a certain year. And uh, we, we just take that data and put it um, uh, and annotate the nodes with that data, and then tell the algorithm to order the orange nodes according to the, the years in an ascending order. This probably gives us even more crossings, but um, we don't, for the moment, we don't care about the crossings, but we, we get a nicer uh, visualization starting from 1940 and going back to, I think, 2020. Um, um, now that we have a good understanding of the structure and the graph, uh, let's think about how we can transform the graph to create a nicer diagram rather than this, well, quite ugly mess still. Um, um, let's start about how we could transform that data in this specific case to come up with a nicer visualization. Uh, we, we already augmented the, the movie data and added the, the year uh, the movie plays into that data. And Basically, what we now have is, is, is a connection from, from the heroes to each of the movies they play in. And if we sort uh, the, the, the movies a certain character plays in in, in, in ascending order, uh, we get a list for each character of the appearances. Uh, and uh, we, instead of having the, the heroes represented as nodes in the visualization, we, we decided to uh, represent those uh, appearances as edges between the movies, labeled edges between the movies. And this uh, replicated the information and, and allowed us to actually remove the, the hero nodes. And then we, we got a, a flow graph, basically showing how the characters flow through the story, through the Marvel Universe stories. And for this, we can use uh, another layout algorithm that is uh, especially useful for uh, visualizing flows. And as you can see, um, once we run that algorithm, we get a nice, uh, much nicer drawing. And there's actually a lot fewer uh, edge crossings now in the diagram. And even and there's still a crossing, for example, at the bottom, there's still one left. But 
in this case, it's even, it even adds, adds value to the visualization. It's not just, a, just an artifact. Uh, it helps the user understand that there's something special happening, that, that characters uh, um, um, switch to another movie f uh, franchise in the Marvel Universe, or that uh, groups of characters merge or diverge or start to, to appear in a certain series. So that's, um, that's, that's a much clearer um, representation of what's actually happening there. Um, interestingly, for, for this visualization, uh, we didn't even have to tell the algorithm to place the, the no nodes in a specific horizontal order. Um, as you can see, um, um, the algorithm automatically um, inferred the order from the flow <coughs> of the edges in the graph. Um, this results in, 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 in artifacts, and we could, we could add back that information about the, the years to the, to the diagram so that we don't get the situation like in this case where there's uh, the Guardians of the Galaxy movie uh, playing in 2014 at the same horizontal, uh, vertical order like Tor in 2018. And, uh, and if we add that information back to the graph as another constraint, um, we get to see this visualization. And now we, we are finally able to understand the, the, the big picture of the story in, in, the, in the Marvel Universe. We see the, the flow of the characters between the different franchises, and we see the different parallel timelines there are. And, and compare that to the original hairball visualization that we had, where basically it had the same visual, uh, information, but, but it's almost impossible to, to, to see that information. Uh, still, this isn't a really beautiful visualization. There, it leaves a lot to be desired, both from a visualization perspective as well as from an interactive perspective. So let's see what we can do to improve that. So we, we'll get back to this specific example with the Marvel uh, Universe graph. And first, let's take a look at the various options we have uh, if, we lose, if we use a um, sophisticated diagramming library like Y files. Um, as a programmer or designer, you basically have full control uh, over how the visualization of a simple node like this uh, could be on the screen. So any data that uh, you have access to, uh, you can add to the, to the visualization, be it textual data or scalar uh, values. And you can, of course, you can use color coding, gorges, and progress bars, and add this information to the visualization. And you can even animate those values if you want to, for example, uh, which is nice if you have access to streaming data updates. So you can connect to live data and show the various volumes right in the visualiza visualization. This gets possible uh, by using uh, complex data bindings, um, uh, making, making it easy for you to, to, um, to take the data that is available in, in memory and create a pre visual presentation of it on the screen. Uh, most of the shelf tools give you, uh, also give you access to that information, but you will have to use uh, separate properties windows to, to browse through that properties, which doesn't work well if you, for example, need to export or print <coughs> the diagram. Using, using a technique like this, you can put all of the information into the diagram, and you can even print it out, but still, um, if you are able to use interaction, um, you can get actually the best of both worlds because uh, it might, you might quickly overload the diagram by adding too many information into, onto the screen. Especially if you zoom out of a diagram, uh, you will get an information overload. So what you can do is use level of detail rendering so that once you zoom out, you only, start, uh, you only see the most important information. And if you focus on a certain uh, set of things, um, you will automatically get more information of all the items uh, in the viewport. Um, you can also add interactive elements directly into the visualization. There could be buttons or even lists where I can scroll through right inside the visualization, uh, inside the diagram. Um, and best of all, you're not limited to, to using these techniques for the visualization of nodes. You could also uh, visualize edges or group nodes, even labels, ports, uh, and all this stuff using the same mechanisms and techniques, augmenting that 
uh, the visualization with, with the data that you have available. And, and last but not least, um, if there, for example, if there are changes in the data, if, the, if new elements get added, um, you can animate uh, the, the change and switch between those two different states in the graph and morph between uh, different layouts of uh, the different uh, um, data sets. And, but it doesn't, it's not always about just the graph elements. Uh, it's also about the background graphics and, and overlays that you can add. So you can add more information to the visualization without uh, putting that information onto the, uh, onto the graph elements. Um, you can add that uh, information as, as, as overlays or you can put the graph into isometric views. You can put maps in the backgrounds. You can add tooltips, uh, hovers, and all this, all these kind of uh, augmentations <coughs> to, to visualization. <clears throat> uh, this brings us to the third pillar for, for creating great visualization applications. The first one being the automatic layout and then the sophisticated uh, visualization. And maybe it's the most important one. It's, it's the custom interaction because it's, it's what what uh, makes a difference uh, in, in contrast to, to, for example, printouts. This, this is re really where an interactive application can shine. Of course, uh, with, a, with a library like this, you can do custom search uh, operations and specifically design for, for the data uh, that the user is dealing with. And, and you can add things like context menus or react to keyboard, multi-touch or pen input. And you can even let the user edit the, the diagram and, if necessary, create new diagrams or data from scratch. And, uh, and these can be really sophisticated editors where, where you have things like, well, of course, drag and drop, clipboard, undo, and re redo, and so on. But you can also uh, um, add a schema validation right into the editor so that users creating or modifying the graphs uh, can be sure that they they are still working with valid data. Either you can actually uh, prevent them from creating in, invalid data, or you can warn them when the, once, once there's, once there's an, 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 a data structure that, that doesn't adhere to the schema that the application is working with. Um, for, for navigating the graph, there's also, of course, the, the typical uh, um, utility views that you may know as the, the bird's eye view where you get to see the, the complete graph um, in, in the background uh, if you want to navigate a larger diagram. But you can also uh, use dynamic utility views like this neighborhood view uh, which can help you uh, see, the, for example, the parents or the children um, of a certain subset of the graph that you're currently focusing on. So this helps uh, maintaining the user's mental map of the complete diagram while at the same time uh, showing a specific relationship in, in, a, in, a, uh, in a small utility view on the side. And this doesn't have to be a simple things like just parent or child relationships. Uh, this could also uh, be the result of some interactive analysis algorithm runs, uh, for example, where, you, where you're showing shortest paths or cycle analysis, analysis or um, uh, whether you're, you're looking for bottlenecks in your network and uh, things like that. Um, and what, of course, once you're done with your analysis, uh, you, can, you can export or print the, the results. And um, if you can't give away the, the, the application that you created to your end users, which usually would be the best option, uh, you can export to any format that uh, um, you have access to. And, so that users can, can, use, uh, can see the results on their own systems. Um, speaking of uh, third-party systems, uh, I already touched the topic of uh, pulling live updates. So you can use third-party systems output as an input to your visualization to augment the visualization showing live data, like for example stock charts in this case. Um, um, but it could also be the other way around. Um, if, if you're the creator of the app, um, you can connect to third-party systems and uh, react to interactions of the user so that, for example, if the user 
uh, clicks on a certain item, you can kick off a process in a third party system to automate uh, certain, certain repetitive processes. Uh, this causes, this uh, makes the user not having to, to leave the application and gives a much better uh, user experience, of course. So, uh, knowing all of this, um, let's get back to the Marvel Universe example <coughs> and see what we finally made out of it. So, uh, we took the visualization that we ha had before, or at least the sketch of it, and we added an interactive legend, easy. Uh, we aligned the incoming and outgoing edges so that it's more easy to follow the flow through the nodes. And, of course, we did some styling, so we added icons uh, to the connectors, and they, they even stick to the, uh, they are always ins visible inside the viewport, so if you zoom into the view and, and, and pan the view, you will always see uh, the hero uh, associated with, with the con connectors. And actually, we, we, we scraped uh, from a th uh, third-party data source the screen, ti screen time information, so how long a character appeared on the screen for each movie, and added that to the visualization. We used that data to influence, uh, to calculate the thickness of the connections and to, and to uh, affect the sizes of the movie nodes. And also, we added some interaction so that you can filter and focus on certain um, elements and uh, uh, on certain heroes, uh, uh, franchises, or movies. And also, we added a background visualization uh, showing the timeline. So this is the resulting mini-app that we created. And I'm proud to tell you that just two weeks ago, we actually won the first place for the visualization in the contest with this little app. Um, it, it, it lets you uh, browse the various uh, uh, heroes, uh, find your favorite hero, and see uh, which, which movies or which series the hero uh, appears in, and see uh, the flow between the, the characters uh, in between the different franchises. And uh, you can see in what order you should be watching the movies in order not to spoil the story, because they haven't been re released in, in chronological in, 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 uh, order, basically. And um, uh, you can focus on certain franchises. And you can try this right now if you want to. It's, it's on yworks.com slash marvel. It's, it's, just, it's a web app. It, you can, it will work on your phone. Um, you can also just try yworks.com slash demos and see a lot more examples of uh, integration options that you have uh, when, when you're using a, a software library like ours. And, well, yeah, that's it for, for now. So uh, I, I'm happy to answer your question now. Thank you, Thank you Sebastian. Great. Hi, I'm uh, Vladimir Alexiev from OntoText. I'm a big fan of uh, generating visualizations and uh, declarative visualizations. In other words, for somebody who uh, doesn't know the full gamut of what they could do, of course, this is not the brilliant results that you've shown, but to automate some things. So we've been using, for example, Plant UML to visualize things from like software processes or UML mm -hmm. diagrams to RDF instance diagrams to. And my question, <laughs> two questions. One is, uh, do you have something for visualizing schemas? I mean, for example, Shaco checks or all ontologies. And the other thing, what do you think about declarative uh, things like uh, Vega, for example? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the first question is whether uh, we have something specific for visualizing s schemas. Um, uh, basically, we ourselves don't have that. Uh, our tool is, is a generic diagramming library. For, for us, it's just items and connections. It's just connected data. Uh, basically, it's, it's our customers uh, who, who are experts in their business domain who add that business domain knowledge and together create a new application which, with, with, with a perfect user experience. So, so the the, the, we don't know much about schemas, but we, we, we do know that many of our customers uh, uh, have been using this tool to create schema editors. Actually, we have been doing this too. We, we have this uh, Neo4j 
Schema Explorer app. It's also online. You will find it on, in our blog where you can just connect to your database and it will try to uh, fetch the schema and render it in a nice um, um, schema diagram. And you can also explore your data. And the good thing, it, it doesn't even, uh, it, it directly connects your browser to the database. So we don't ever get to see your data. It all happens inside the browser. It's just the power of the JavaScript library. And this is a schema viewer. It's not an editor in this case, it's, it's a viewer. But um, uh, companies uh, similar to, to what Plantium L does uh, are using uh, our products exactly for that purpose, for, for uh, visualizing schemas. And the second question, uh, what I think about declarative, uh, um, declaratively uh, configuring visualizations, um, they can work. It really depends on, on the use case. I'm not saying that the, the off-the-shelf solutions are all bad, not at all. They, they, are, uh, they are very good for many use cases if you're just starting to get acquainted with the graph. And then it's mostly declarative things like, like I said before, like, well, co color all the movie nodes blue, which is just a declaration that's, and in a way, programming is also declarative, where you, you say what should happen with the data. But uh, as soon as it's, the, the, the use case gets more, more specific, there's more, more users working with the data and they want to, uh, to see their specific day-to-day uh, um, -day work um, uh, improved through, that, um, through using such a visualization, such an interactive visualization, then I think there's currently no way around actually doing programming, which, which really helps you to get the most complicated uh, um, uh, connections together, which most of the time doesn't work declaratively. So, so some of these is just too complex and it's, but it's both are an option. It really depends on the specific use case. Thank you. Other, Other questions? questions? Hi, um, Ivan from Open Corporates. Um, how do you deal with data uh, where nodes or edges uh, have, are very rich in attributes? So do you have maybe some templates that help you visualize uh, those? Uh, or can you suggest some maybe UI tricks? <laughs> That's a difficult question. Uh, it's, luckily, it's a question most of the time our customers need to answer for themselves. <laughs> um, um, it, it's just like saying, hey, well, my, my, my table has like 500 columns. Tell me which ones to show. Well, I don't know. It really depends on, on the use case. So um, if, if you, the more use cases you know, you know uh, you're aware of, uh, the better you know which information you should be putting on front of, of the visualization and which ones you might be putting into into uh, uh, secondary utility views. So there's no generic answer to that, I'm sorry. Well, you, you could display the, the table inside the node, but well, it doesn't look too good, actually. It's, and the user interaction is probably not so good. But the different nodes that you showed, are those kind of coded by the customers? Um, yeah. Or uh, do you have templates? Yeah, um, um, you, can, you can use coding to, to create those visualizations. And there's also templating engines. Uh, in the case of Wi-Files for HTML, the JavaScript version, uh, you can use tools like uh, Angular or React or Vue.js to, to create the templates for the nodes and then use data bindings to, to actually populate the visualization. But you can also do this programmatically. So, so we, uh, we're, we're not closed in that sense. So anything that you can do with SVG or maybe even Canvas or WebGL, you can use to put it on the screen. So it's, it's, it's always up to you. It's, again, use case specific. Sorry for not being more, sp more specific. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have maybe time for one last question, if somebody has one. Okay, I guess not. So, off to lunch. Thank you all. Thank you.